last time I made that video explaining mechanics formulas, somebody asked me to do the same thing for statistics. Now, I haven't done stats since June. I'm going to explain this as best as I can, but please bear with me. So I think we can all agree that the most difficult thing when it comes to stats is the distribution formulas. So you have binomial and you also have normal and then you have the graphy stuff which you don't need to think about. So first things first we need to compare them. <sighs> so with the binomial distribution it's just this formula here which hopefully you're familiar with. So obviously n is the number of trials, p is the probability, q is 1 minus p, it's just the opposite of the probability, r is the number of successes. So there are more factors to consider than this for the binomial. The trials are independent constant probability you also have that there's only like two possible outcomes and stuff but it's just that's what we need to think about when we're comparing it to the normal and then this is how you describe it so you go x has the distribution for the binomial the number of trials and the probability of success so you really only use the binomial distribution for discrete data things that are going to be exact so discrete variables are always better represented on a vertical line graph like this whereas normal distributions concerned with ranges therefore have a normal distribution like that so the normal distribution can be described using this it's x has the distribution of the normal with the mean and then the squared standard deviation. The tricky bit when it comes to normal distribution is that you also have to think about whether it's a sample or whether it's using all the data. What I did after I learned this is whenever I went into an exam and got into a stats question that was about the normal distribution, straight away looked at it and I went through a checklist in my head. Is it a sample? Is it full data? Etc. Etc. And I just picked out exactly what I need to do before I even started thinking about the question. You need to have that checklist of this, that, this, that before you go wrong and have to do it all again so if it is a sample you'll be using n minus one in the formulas but if it's all the data you'll just be using n so also if it is a sample then the distribution changes slightly to this which is actually very important okay so i've just drawn this on to help it explain obviously ignore that it's higher than the y-axis so if you have all the data say there's 50 it doesn't really work like that but let's just say we have a big group of things big group of 100 now we're taking a sample of that so we're only taking 10 the likelihood that out of 10 we're going to get the very extreme ones is slim we're more likely going to get the ones close to the center because that's where they are most frequent which is why the new sample graph will look a lot thinner and taller than the whole data one which is that which is why we have to use n minus one or the n there another key thing to remember is obviously that the mean is n multiplied by the probability if you look at my little graph down here we have a nice little normal distribution now these parts that i've shaded it in are where the critical values lie this is in the situation where it's considering it as actual numbers rather than the probability those are two completely separate graphs and you can't get them mixed up I'm just going to change my graph slightly to this as this makes it a bit more easy to understand so you've got the left side and the right side okay if the z value is less than the critical value cb on the left hand side it's significant or if it's greater than on the right hand side it's significant the easiest way to understand that is not violating in the words it's just by drawing the diagram if the z value the number you've actually worked out is inside the shaded region it is significant whereas if it's in this white section it's not significant another thing you need to go through on that checklist is whether the test is two-tailed or one-tailed if it is two-tailed the diagram would look like this if it's one-tailed the diagram will look like that if the diagram is two-tailed you will have to half your significance level so that is a really key point where you could make a mistake as well so this is the normal checklist whenever you get onto a question about the normal distribution straight away run through this in your head and tick it off before you make a mistake that you would then have to start again over. I am struggling to explain this I'm not gonna lie. So again linking to the idea that everything changes based on a sample so you've got the idea the sample is n minus one and then this is this is actually a full different description so you've got to use that in this formula so if you're wanting to find the standard deviation of a sample you've got to take that and square root it which actually turns it into this and then that value you can use in your calculator everything is difficult to explain because you do it all on a calculator I can't really show you but another thing I am going to point out is that when you're using the calculator you obviously also put in a lower value and a higher value if you're doing it in the situation where there is a continuous upper value you're seeing how great it can be absolutely no limit on that it's infinity I would normally put into my calculator that the upper value is 9 by 10 to the 91 because that was going to create such a little difference from infinity that it basically is infinity it's not gonna it's gonna give you the right answer so if I was doing it the opposite 
opposite way on the left hand side where it was a negative value, I would just put minus nine by 10 to the 91. So it's this bit where we're thinking about lower values and upper values that we have to start thinking about continuity corrections. Let me just literally read this from my book. Whenever a discrete distribution is approximated by a continuous one, a continuity correction may need to be used. Let's take this as an example for continuity corrections. If we are saying that X is greater than or equal to 20, we would put the lower value as 19.5. If we're saying that X is definitely greater than 20, we would put the lower value as 20.5. Always round to the nearest 0.5. Remember, you only ever do this when the data is discrete. Discrete data means it takes an exact value, whereas normally with the normal distribution, we have continuous data, which means we can measure it to an infinite number of decimal places, such as weight, mass, height, anything like that. You may also need to use the normal distribution as an approximate for the binomial when n is large or np is too close to zero. Generally, you won't actually have to use that. You just have to give it as a reason in the answer to a question. So this is also where people do tend to get confused. So if the z value, as we've said, the z value is greater than the critical value on the right hand side of the graph, it is significant. But if the probability is less than the significance level, two completely different things the significance level is not the same as the critical value and it's also significant so these are two completely different graphs that depends entirely on which numbers you choose to find out so it just depends on which values you get and then how you interpret that and again just to clarify this would normally be the normal z formula but if it is taken from a sample then this is the z formula one of the first things you learn in year 12 is all about probability and venn diagrams so let's really quickly run through that so the probability that is either a or b is equal to probability of a plus the probability of b subtracts the probability of a and b and you can mix that up again to rearrange the formula to find something else. If it is mutually exclusive then the probability of a or b is simply the probability of a plus the probability of b. The probability of it being a and b is zero because they can't happen at the same time and the probability of a and b for independent events is simply the probability of a multiplied by the probability of b. The fact it says and means it must satisfy both whereas if it says or it only has to to satisfy what? So let's look at that in a bit more of a complicated Venn diagram. We have this one here. This is C and this is D. So the probability that it is not C or it is D has this little shaded region here. So the fact that it's not C includes all of the outside and the fact that it is D also includes the middle section. And also remember that for conditional probability, the probability that B occurs given that A has already occurred is equal to the probability of B and A all over the probability of A. If these events are independent, this would be probability of A multiplied by the probability of B, which means the probability of A would cancel out that probability of A. So the probability of B given A is just equal to the probability of B. And you can also rearrange this formula as on how you like to find what you need to find. Just remember that it splits up into a probability tree just like this and you'd multiply the probabilities across. The discrete random variable can take any certain number. So the probability of it always adds up to one. Therefore, to work out the probability of three, just take all of these other probabilities away from from one and you work out the answer. Cumulative frequency graph, compound bar chart. And then we also have all the different types of samples. So for a simple random sample, you need a sampling frame. Everybody's equally likely to be chosen and it is done by using random numbers or by being computerized. It's the same as like picking numbers out of a hat. And then you've also got stratified sampling. This is where all subgroups are sampled and the number that are sampled in each subgroup is proportional to their population size within the whole population. So you use a sampling fraction for that. So then one's actually in the subgroup it's done by simple random sampling again and this is very accurate and then we have cluster sampling cluster sampling is where a limited number of clusters are chosen from those are sampled but the clusters must be representative of the whole population that's like a few towns being chosen out of the whole of the country and then we have systematic sampling this is where individuals are chosen from a sampling frame but you must be aware of cyclic patterns that may be occurring which would make it inaccurate that could be like choosing from a register or an electoral roll and then we've also got quota sampling which is often used by companies and it's also non-random. This is like a company going out and surveying 20 males and 20 females. Opportunity sampling is useful for social scientists but it's the weakest form of sampling because it produces biased results. It is simply used when circumstances make it readily available, it makes it easy to do it, like you just stand at a room and survey everybody that comes in. And finally the self-selecting sample is where people volunteer to take part but this is also not used in serious research as it produces biased results and may not be conclusive as the volunteers may refuse 
to answer certain questions. The best way I would recommend learning all of those samples is by using flashcards. We also have a histogram which has a frequency density on the y-axis. To work out the frequency you just work out the area of each bar so frequency equals class width multiplied by frequency density. And just to pick up on those certain silly questions, measure of spread means the range or the IQR, the interquartile range. And then you've also got central tendency which is median, mean and mode. We also have to remember our standard box and whisker plot. So minimum Q1, Q2, Q3 and the maximum. So IQR is Q3 minus Q1. And then we also have a stem and leaf diagram and remember to put your key in. And also to find the weighted mean, you need to multiply all of the numbers by their own individual weights, add up all those answers and then also add up all of the weights and divide the answers by their weight. And remember if you end up with a scattergraph like this, there is likely to be no correlation because they're two separate groups. And remember that a regression line is just a calculated line of best fit. Okay, so then we have an association which describes linear or non-linear relationships as long as one of the variables is random. And then a correlation is a special type of association, but both variables must be random, the relationship must be linear. And therefore a change in one of the variables is likely to be accompanied by a great change in the other variable. So the key things you have to learn from this is just what to do with the information you do not have to work out the rank correlations yourself as you just don't you don't with aqa anyway I'm, everything i'm saying is just from aqa you just have to know what things sort of mean h o rho this letter is rho equals zero is simply stating that there is no correlation another answer which may come up quite frequently in questions is that correlation does not prove causation r stands for p and c c which is the product moment correlation coefficient or the pearson's product moment correlation coefficient so this is used to calculate the significance of a correlation not an associated if it's an association, therefore the relationship is non-linear or something like that, you would have to use RS, which is Spearman's rank correlation coefficient or Spearman's association coefficient. If R is greater than the critical value, then it is significant, therefore you accept H1. So with hypothesis tests, you should also remember that H0 means the null hypothesis and H1 means alternative hypothesis. You also need to be really clear in your conclusion, whether you are rejecting or accepting HO. And also just to clarify, to either find the critical value or the significant level you need one or the other and you'd also need to use your calculator so to find it on a standard scale you'd say that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one and then the area is the significance level so if we're taking it at the 2.5 significance level and for a one tail test it would be 0.025 but for a two tail test you'd halve it and it would be 0.0125 so then by putting that into your calculator you would be able to find out the critical value and then depending on the side you can compare the critical value to the z value to decide if it's significant or not so if we run through a binomial question we are Saying that the null hypothesis is that p equals 0.6 but the alternative is that p is less than 0.6 so say we complete a survey and we get an r value of 9 out of 20 people then to work out the probability of this because our alternative is saying that p is less than 0.6 we are going to find out the probability of less than or equal to 9 you always make it inclusive of that number which we actually find out is approximately 0.1275 so if we're testing that against the 5% significance level which is 0.05 on a one test then 0.1275 is greater than this therefore it's not significant we accept h0 and reject h1 if you're wanting it to be significant you're wanting the probability to be as small as possible therefore to be significant it needs to be smaller than the significance level if this question changed and it was that the probability was actually greater than 0.6 you would change this work out the probability that r is greater than or equal to 9 you always make it equal to you always make it inclusive the sign should match the sign of h1 and obviously these numbers are different okay then say we've got a different question which is referring to the normal distribution where the mean is 4 the standard deviation is 0.08 they're asking us the question of the probability of finding one item that is greater than 4.04 in weight for example so it weighs more than 4.04 so the first thing we need to do is draw a diagram so this is the diagram we have a 4 which is the mean and then this is what we're looking to find 4.04 and the probability that it's greater than that. Okay, so because this is actually a continuous variable, weight and height and things like that are always continuous because continuous means we can measure it to an infinite number of decimal places. So it's not discrete, so we don't use continuity corrections. We say that the lower value is 4.04 and the upper value, again, infinite, is 9 by 10 to the 91. Pop that into your calculator and it'll tell you that the probability is 0.3085. 
five. Now, if this question then changes, it advances on a bit more and it asks us to find out the probability that the mean of a sample is greater than 4.04, we would have to change this slightly. So first things first, we need a new standard deviation. So just following that again, you just pop those numbers from before into here. Remember, because it's a sample, so we've got a new formula, assuming that the number in the sample is 25. And then once we find those answers, popping it into the calculator to find the new probability of 0.0062. So if we have a significance level of 2%, a N of 90, HO of, of that mean equals 2, but an alternative hypothesis where the mean is less than 2, and we've also got this data here, we can start to draw a diagram. So we can draw a diagram like this where the mean is 2. We can also, because it's a sample, we're using this formula, pop in those numbers and get minus 1.65. And because the test is only one tailed, we've done an area of 0.02 and with the standard scale of u equals 0 and the standard deviation being 1, pop that into the calculator, we've got an area of minus 2.05. So minus 1.65 is greater than minus 2.05. It's not inside the shaded region, therefore it's not significant and we accept HO. So to put that into the basic terms again, on the left hand side of the graph, the z value is greater than the critical value so it's not significant and we reject h1 it's not inside that shaded region anyway that is everything obviously i've covered everything as best as i can i'm a little bit rusty but thank you for watching anyway and i really hope that helps bye